Good morning, church family. Today we have the honor and privilege of opening up in worship again. We, we had baptisms last week, uh, and this week we get to have a baptism again. Uh, and today is a very special day. It's a very special day for me uh, because I get to baptize my son. Uh, and so, Zeke, why don't you come on down, buddy? All right. Why don't you step on up? All right. Church family, this is Zeke Gunn. He is seven years old, and uh, at Easter of two years ago, 2019, Zeke came forward and said that he was ready to follow God uh, and ready to uh, admit that he was a sinner and to follow him all the days of his life. And, and so today, uh, we've been waiting to get baptized. He's been waiting until he's ready, and, and he let us know about a month ago that he was ready to get baptized and, and tell everybody about the decision that he made. So, we are here today. Zeke, are you ready? Okay. Are you going to follow God all the days of your life? Yes, sir. Even when it's uncool? Mm -hmm. Even when it's hard? Yes. What about when you are 17? Yes. How about when you're 47? Yes. Okay. So all the days of your life, you're going to follow God and listen? Mm-hmm. Okay. Good, good. All right, Zeke. I baptize you down, my brother, in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Proud of you, buddy. Amen. Proud of you. All right. All right, let's continue in worship together.
sing for joy in the Lord, you righteous ones. Praise is becoming to the upright. Give thanks to the Lord with the lyre. Sing praises to him with a harp of ten strings. Sing to him a new song. Play skillfully with a shout of joy. For the word of Jehovah is right, and all his work is done in faithfulness. The Lord loves righteousness and justice. The earth is full of by the word of Jehovah were the heavens made, and the host of them by the breath of his mouth. He gathers the water of the sea together as a heap. He lays up the deeps in the storehouse. Let all the earth fear the Lord. Let all the inhabitants of the world stand in awe of him. For he spoke, and it was done. He commanded, and it stood firm. The Lord nullifies the plan of nations. He frustrates the plans of peoples. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord, the people he has chosen for his own inheritance. The plan of the Lord stands forever. The plans of his heart from generation to generation. The Lord looks from heaven. He sees all the sons of mankind. From his dwelling place, he looks out on all the inhabitants of the earth. He who fashions the hearts of them all, he understands all their works. A king is not saved by a mighty army. A warrior is not delivered by great strength. A horse is a false hope for victory, nor does it rescue anyone by its strength. Behold, the eye of the Lord is on those who fear him, on those who wait for his faithfulness. To deliver their soul from death and to keep them alive in faith. Our soul waits for the Lord. He is our help and our strength. For our heart rejoices in him because we trust in his holy name. Let your loving kindness, O Lord, be upon us, according as we have hoped in you. Are you grateful for their service? Amen. Amen. So thankful to be a church at the heart of this city, this military city, USA, and we will continue to be a harbor and a place that continues to love and support our military families. So God bless you, um, veterans. So we're going to take a moment just to, to welcome those around us in worship. And we, it's been uh, um, different than what we normally do during this season. We're just going to wave at each other, but we just want to acknowledge that we're here together. We're doing this united. So God bless you. If you're with us at home, we are so thankful to have you with us today. So stand up, wave around the room. God bless you. Welcome to worship, everybody. Welcome, welcome. It's, to, it's good to be here, and we're glad that you're able to worship with us at the First Baptist Church of San Antonio, both in the room and across the city. Uh, we are grateful to be able to worship and continue in this way. Now, first, let me get to the numbers. We are at day 241 of this pandemic. It's a lot of days. Sunday number 35 of this pandemic. And on Sunday number 35, um, let me remind you, we will be taking Lord's Supper together today. So in the room, you should have the prepackaged elements. Uh, if you're worshiping with us on TV this morning, you may want to find your own elements to participate in the supper with us um, at the end of the service. Now let me thank you. First, thank you for, for being flexible. We have faced many changes over the last 241 days, but you have been graceful. So thank you for that. Thank you for your grace, and thank you for being willing to be flexible and to do what we need to do to gather safely. And I also want to thank you this morning uh, on, as, as we celebrate our veterans and 
as we look back on the last week, to thank you for voting. Voting is a God-given right that few through history have enjoyed. See, this is a privilege in our country, and it's our responsibility to participate. So thank you. Thank you for going to the polls. Thank you for exercising your right to participate in our government. That is exactly what you should be doing. But even as we say that, I do want to give you one word of caution. And this is the perfect reminder for this time of year. No politician is going to save you, ever. We worship a God who orchestrates life in the smallest molecules of our being. We worship a God who knows the number of hairs on our head. We worship a God who loves and protects his children. No politician can do any of that. And you know, we need the constant reminder that anything a politician can possibly do, God has already done. And in the countless ways that politicians fail you, God can heal. And again, that doesn't mean we shouldn't participate in the political system. We should. We should be involved as much as we possibly can be. But remember to keep it in proper perspective. When things go well, we lift our arms and our voices and our heads up and we praise the Lord. And when things are difficult, we cry out to that same God instead of invoking names of politicians past. You, you, have, you have nothing to fear if you are God's child. And in fact, let me remind you of Israel's history. You know, one of, one of Israel's common mistakes was their fear of their political position and their fear of their military position. And when fear took root in Israel, one of their preferred indulgences was to think fondly back on Egypt. Just after being freed by God from Egyptian slavery, the Israelites wondered if they should seek help from their old slave master, Pharaoh. And just like in, in 721 B.C., Assyria is invading Israel. And what is the best solution they can come up with? They said the best solution that we can find is a political one. Let's go ask Pharaoh if he can help us. The children of God said, let's go to Pharaoh. And let me tell you, this was God's reply to them in Isaiah 31. This is how God spoke to Israel in that day. Woe to those who go down to Egypt for help and rely on horses and trust in chariots because they're many and in horsemen because they are strong, but they do not look to the Holy One of Israel, nor do they seek the Lord. Now here at the First Baptist Church of San Antonio, we look to our holy God. We seek the Lord in this place. And for our nation, we cry out as we have all year long, Lord, help us, God, heal us, heal this land. And that has not changed even with an election. Because our hope is not in a political system, but our hope is in the name of the Lord our God. And that is who we worship this morning. That is why we come together. That's why we participate in worship is because God is good and his protection is over his children. So let's pray together and we'll continue in worship. Lord, we come before you bowing our knee to you, our Lord, our rock, our savior, our redeemer, our hope for all eternity. That Lord, we turn to you in uncertain days. And as we worship this morning, we ask that you would heal our land. Lord, that you would intervene as only you can, that we might look up and praise your name because it was only God who could have healed. And until then, Father, we are going to gather and we are going to worship. We're going to sing praises to your name. We're going to shout Jesus as Lord from the rooftops. Lord, that will be our cry. And it's in that name, the name that is above every other name that's on the face of this earth, Jesus Christ, that we pray. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Chris, for your leadership now and through this, this entire season. We are so grateful. 
Okay, everybody, welcome 2.0. So 2020 is weird. Is that fair? And I probably did not help things when you came to worship this morning or you came to the church this morning, you walked in and you saw Christmas trees. That probably did not help, you know, because some, some of these weeks have felt like decades and, and all of a sudden you see Christmas. So Christmas at first this year is going to be, look and feel different and we're having to pre-record everything and because of that we needed to have some of our Christmas decorations up. So I tried to keep just... Focus on the harvest, everybody. Just keep, just <laughs> focus on this. Focus on Jesus <laughs> with the harvest as our backdrop. He's going to get me for that. Okay. <laughs> so I just wanted I, a little w word of disclosure there. Um, so we now focus on the word. Have you been grateful to be in the word this week? Yes. Here's a scripture that you didn't know you needed this morning when you came to worship this morning and, and as I read this, you just didn't know you needed this. And so as I read it, I, I want you to be filled. So you follow along, Hebrews 10, 19 through 25. Therefore, brethren, since we have confidence to enter the holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way which he inaugurated for us through the veil, that is, his flesh. And since we have a great high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a sincere heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed pure with water. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how to stimulate one another to love and good deeds, and not forsaking our assembling together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. Our hymnody today is lifted straight out of our, our reverse reading, so let's start with I Am Resolved, hymn 301, wherever you are, let's stand together and let's sing.
Good morning, children. We're so glad that our children can be with us, even though it has to be this way, even though it's through the TV or out in the congregation. But this morning for children's sermon, we we get to just rejoice again. We get to rejoice with Zeke. We've gotten to do a, a, a number of baptisms lately, and that's been fun. I'm glad you've been able to see those baptisms and see Zeke's testimony of following Jesus Christ. That's, that's one of the, the first steps. After we say, Jesus is Lord of my life, then we run to the baptistry and we get baptized. And then one of the things that follows that, one of the great privileges of being a believer or follower of Jesus Christ after you're, bapti- after you're baptized, is you get to take the Lord's Supper with us. And so the way we do the Lord's Supper here, you need to know this and take note of this, that anybody is welcome to take the supper with us, the bread and the cup, so long as you've already accepted Jesus as your Savior. Now, one of the markers that we have for that is baptism. But if you haven't yet accepted Jesus as your Savior, or you haven't yet maybe been baptized, then it's not time yet for you to take this. But we wait. And we wait until that time when we follow Jesus Christ and we accept him as our Lord. And one of the joys and one of the privileges of doing that is after the next time we get to take the supper, you get to take it with us. Like today, Zeke gets to take the supper with us and it's truly a joy and it's a wonderful thing. And so if you're at home, um, we hope if you're already a believer and you've already accepted Jesus, you can find your elements and take that with us. And the same thing in the room for any of the children that have accepted Christ, you can take this with us so long as you've already made that commitment. So let's pray together and we'll continue in worship. Lord, we thank you for this time. And Lord, we pray that every one of our children would come to know you as their personal Lord and Savior. Lord, that every one of them would seek your face and be transformed by your spirit. Lord, that they would be lights in their homes, lights in their schools, lights across the city beaming the glory and grace of Jesus Christ. And it's in his name we pray, amen. We lean in, we lean into the spirit uh, in our walk every day and that's, that's our hope and our prayer that, that as we follow the example of Paul and his admonition to us that we will press on, we will lean in and that our gaze will be fixed on that upward call. So, so let's sing that. Uh, Higher Ground is the hymn that we'll be singing together, hymn 484. Let's stand together and let's worship and get ready to hear from the word this morning.
That was that was better with the pumpkins. 
<laughs> at 8.30, he called everybody in the service to, to look to the pumpkins um, for the service. <laughs> So we, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll look past the pumpkins uh, now uh, to our text, uh, Philippians 3, 12 through 16. In fact, if you will find it in your listening sheet there, we're going to read that aloud together. So if you would, stand with me and we're going to read that. This then is the text for today. Not that I have already obtained it or have already become perfect, but I press on so that I may lay hold of that for which also I was laid hold of by Christ Jesus. Brethren, I do not regard myself as having laid hold of it yet, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and reaching forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Let us therefore, as many as are perfect, have this attitude. And if any of you have a different attitude, God will reveal that also to you. However, let us keep living by that same standard to which we have attained. May God bless the reading of his word. We got through that a little better than 832. Well done there. It's a wordy text we have this morning in Philippians 3. Now, in most sermons, I try to find a metaphor to help us to, to latch onto so that we might remember better uh, the word of the Lord that morning. And, and sometimes the metaphors come easy, sometimes they're harder to find. But today, here it is. In fact, Paul, in this letter to the Philippians, gives us the metaphor that we need for our lesson this morning. And so he, he lays it out clearly. He says, this is the best metaphor for the lesson that we have today, and you might miss it if you're not careful. Look with me again at verse 13. This is what I'm talking about. So Philippians 3, verse 13. Brethren, I do not regard myself as having laid hold of it yet, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind, and then here, here's the metaphor, and reaching forward to what lies ahead. Now, reaching forward here is a very specific metaphor. You, you need to picture a runner. And in fact, picture a runner in the 100-meter dash at the Olympics. And so as you picture this, the, the, what we're looking at really is the photo finish. So what you see and what you picture is that runner in the 100 meter dash in, in the last step before the finish line. What they do in that last step is they lean forward so they can get the most out of their race in the best possible time. You see, Paul didn't want anybody to misunderstand God's grace. And he didn't want anybody to misunderstand God's forgiveness. And it's easy to do because some people and people in Paul's day and through the centuries, people have surmised that surely then if God is full of mercy, then I can coast through life. Or surely then if God is a forgiving God, then I can do whatever I want because he will forgive me. But those who are in Christ know that that is not the case. That's not who we are in Jesus Christ. In fact, in Christ and with Christ, we strive with all that we are to live out that call that God has placed upon our lives, even all the way to that very last step as we lean forward at the end to the very last step of life. We are with Christ and we are striving forward and we are moving best as we come to the last steps on this earth. Even then, leaning in towards heaven. In fact, if you, you look down through verses 12, 13, and 14, this is the very thing that uh, Paul's talking about here. It's this whole analogy of a runner. And, and it's a reminder, and his call upon us is that you are in a race right now. Whether you know it or not, or whether you like it or not, you are in a race this day. And, and in fact... The way, the way we see it and, and, and the way Scripture calls it is even though we are in this race towards heaven, most people are just stuck in the blocks. Most people across the world just haven't even gotten out yet. 
You see, this is how it begins. When you begin the 100 meter dash, all the runners begin in the blocks, feet firmly fixed so that you can accelerate out as quickly as po uh, possible when the starter's pistol goes off. In life, it's like God is before us and God has said, ready, set, go. And then when God gave the call to go, most people just cower. They don't move, they refuse to listen. They're just stuck there in the blocks and won't go anywhere. They don't care what God has said and they don't care what God is doing, they're just stuck. They're stuck at the beginning of the race and won't move forward. But what God is saying and God is calling down from heaven and God is calling out through his word and through his church. God is saying, I have the perfect way forward for you. In fact, it's right here, straight down this lane. If you will run towards God, life will be right and you will be made righteous. But so many just refuse. They don't want to have anything to do with God. And, and it's amazing, non-believers just do this always, but there, there's also some believers who get stuck here too. In fact, one of the things, uh, one of the uh, people we should picture is maybe somebody like Jonah, right? That when, when God says, ready, set, go, some of us just turn and look to God and say, no. And, and some people just get up and start walking the other direction. They turn around and they walk off. Now hear me this morning. That you, you can only do that for so long. You can only ignore God for so long. You can only deny God for so long. Because one day the fiery wrath of God comes down upon our lives. When Jesus Christ says, follow me, we go immediately. Now, for those that listen and those that have ears to hear, clear the blocks and you get out in a fury. And often the initial moments of our Christian walk looks like what you see in the Gospels that are so many that are, that are turning to Christ and coming to Christ in this, this, this moment of excitement where there's an intense joy and freedom that comes from knowing Jesus Christ as your Savior. And that's what we need to understand together as a church and, and as a city that the initial step so that, that first step out of the box is saying, Jesus Christ is Lord. That's where we go first. This is what we declare it to our families. We declare it to the world. We declare it to God. We declare it over our own selves. Jesus Christ is Lord. And when you do that, you're, you're stepping out in life in the right direction. You're headed down the right lane. Then as sprinters go, you begin to react. You, you clear the blocks and, and you, you drive. And your legs start to pick up speed. But, but in those first steps, you're still kind of bent down. You're over. You're not up yet. And in those first steps, you're kind of, you're low. You're not at your full stride yet. Many of us find ourselves here. At this point, maybe, maybe think about the Peter walking on water. Because there he goes, following Jesus Christ. And then there he goes, sinking. Right? He, he, was, he was close. He was growing in the Lord. But down he went. We, we picture Peter uh, rebuking Jesus or, or Peter swinging the sword at the high priest's servant. He, Peter was walking with the Lord, but he didn't have his stride yet. He was learning and he was growing in the faith. And we, we all have to. Don't, don't mistake learning for faithlessness. Don't mistake a B uh, for an F. You see, he was, he was still growing and trying to, to figure out how to run at full speed. And none of us get up to full speed on our own. Don't think you have to grow in faith by yourself because you can't do that either. You, you, you need the Lord with you. See, none of us are going to get to full speed in faith without walking with Jesus for a long time. And so we walk with him and he helps pull us forward. Now, unfortunately, this is where many people, even some believers, just drop out of the race. They mistake the early learning curve for failure. But, but what God reminds us is that, that even if you stumble out of the block or even if it takes exponentially longer than you ever anticipated for you to get up to your full stride, don't give up. Because God is with you and God is, God is for you and God is running with you in this life. Don't give up. 
even though you're not there yet. Keep pushing forward. And when you start to think that you're not nearly as far along in faith as you think you ought to be, no, it's okay. It's okay as long as you keep pushing forward. You keep driving your legs forward with the Christ because at this point, the only real failure is to drop out of the race, to stop trying to give up on the Lord. And we can't do that this morning. We can't give up on the Lord. Now, once you do find your faith, or you, you get past those moments, and once you find your full stride in faith, remarkable things begin to happen. See, the next, next phase of the race is, is accelerating forward, and, and that's where you come up and you stand up straight and your eyes are looking forward, you're looking out high towards the finish line. And, and as you do, you begin to see that upward call of Christ Jesus towards heaven, and it's beautiful. You, you begin to experience those faith moments that you'd only heard about. And you begin to experience what, it, what it's like to have your prayers answered by God in an instant. You, you begin to, to, to know what, it, what it's like to see an angel or having the truth jump off the page at you. When you have a question in mind and God speaks you directly through his word, th these kinds of things happen and it's a wonderful thing in the life of a believer. And as you're accelerating, then you come to top speed. This is the fastest your body can run. Now, for a human being, the fastest that we can possibly run is about 27 miles an hour. Usain Bolt did this not long ago. But then, in 2011, Justin Gatlin ran faster than Usain Bolt. But it didn't count because they said his run was wind-aided. And that's what you need to know this morning. And Jesus Christ was perfectly clear with us. When, when we start running towards that upward call of God, we are always wind-aided. In fact, that's, that's the only thing that counts is when you're wind-aided. That, that we can go far beyond our human ability, far beyond our imagination, far beyond our capabilities because the Spirit of God is pushing us forward. The, the wind of God is this mighty rush through our lives and pressing us on towards the end. You see, there, there are things that God is calling us to do as a church. There are things that God are calling us to do as individuals, and, and you're not ready, and you're not able, but so be it because the Holy Spirit is able. God is more powerful than all of us combined. See, God is with us, and the Spirit is behind us, and we can do mighty things for the sake of the kingdom of God. You know, it's, it's interesting yeah, with the win, Gatlin was only 0.13 seconds faster than Usain Bolt. Now, the Holy Spirit's much better than that. In fact, it's probably better for us to think about the Holy Spirit in, in this way. There are these scientists right now who are working on what they call exoskeletons. Now, these exoskeletons are braces that connect to like your hips and your knees and your ankles. And, and these are not, not for health reasons, they're actually to make you stronger and to make you faster. And in fact, there's one company that has a computer-generated model of an exoskeleton that they claim will, will help any of you in the room run 40 miles an hour. <laughs> now, could you imagine any of us with <laughs> robotic leg braces running 40 miles an hour down Broadway back here? <laughs> I would hurt myself. But you know, this is how we can think of the Holy Spirit. Because the, the Spirit takes us to speeds and heights that we're not capable of on our own. See, in Christ, by the Holy Spirit, your top speed just skyrocketed. It's off the charts. The creator of the heavens and the earth is behind you and with you. He is beyond physics. He is beyond life. He is, he is capable of more than anything that we have ever imagined as humanity. And he is with us and he is for us. And we press on, and we're, we're maintaining uh, our top speed then as a sprinter goes down the lane. And, and as you're sprinting, the finish line is getting closer by the second. It just keeps coming, it's coming. And in this metaphor, and, and in the scripture here in Philippians 3, the, the finish line then is death. 
And, and the closer you get to the finish line, you keep your eyes on the prize. In fact, you narrow your focus further and further down to earth. That is, that is your concentration. That is, that is your hope. This is all you can think of in this moment is, is being with the Christ. You don't look back. You push forward. And no one slows down at the end of the race. In fact, what you see on those fast racers is in that last step, they lean forward and they lean in to gain fractions of a second on their times. Don't stop short. Don't turn around at the finish line. How foolish would it be if we were 98% done and we gave up? You see, at the end of our lives, faith, faith should be multiplying so our wisdom directly from the Lord. And, and the older we are, the, the more we're seeking Jesus Christ. The older we are, the, the more that we're working for the Savior. We remember as we've been studying Philippians for the last few weeks that as Paul writes this letter to the Philippians, he was facing the uncertainty of being chained up in Rome, a prisoner. And not only the uncertainty of being a prisoner, but the case and the charges that have been brought against him would require the death penalty that he might be executed here. And even facing that, even in chains, even facing the death penalty, he's going out of his way to work for Jesus as much as possible. The closer death got, the harder he was working for the sake of the kingdom of God. He's saying this, this is when we kick it into high gear. This is when we lean forward and lean into what God's got for us. The closer death comes, the more faithful I'm going to be for the sake of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Now, we do have to be careful with metaphors because metaphors only go so far. And we have to be careful with this metaphor because we need to slow down a minute. Sometimes we think when, when we say kick it into high gear that we think just frantically doing anything and everything, doing as much as possible but that's not what we mean here. This isn't about you just being busy, and this isn't about you doing as much as possible. This is, this is a, about a level of intensity for obeying Jesus Christ. That I'm not just gonna do anything and everything, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna focus in on who Jesus is. And, and my intensity is going to be a complete obedience into him. And, and, and the, the longer I live, the more intense that, that call and that life of obedience in is following Jesus Christ. And that's what I'm gonna do. And we don't waste any time doing that. Don't waste any time obeying the Lord. And one of the things Jesus told us to do was to stop for a moment. And he said, at times of worship and times where you gather, you need to stop. And you need to remember me in a very particular way. In the bread and in the cup. You need to remember me in a meal. And so as we think about this metaphor of running and pressing forward in life, when you think about a meal, they don't seem to fit. That a meal is where you stop and you sit down and you rest a moment. But what Jesus is saying is these go just hand in hand. When you are obeying me, that is the, the leaning forward. That, that's taking the next step. That, that's, that's getting into your full stride when you're obeying me even as you take of the bread and the cup. So let's now prepare together to take the supper. So at home, if you would begin to gather your elements, and in the room, we'll, we'll, we'll take ours, and, and be careful, there, there's two tabs. Peel the, the top one off there, and you'll find the bread. Now before we take of this, I do wanna pray, and we're going to pray that God would prepare our hearts for what we're about to do. Because what we're about to do is take of the body and blood of Jesus Christ, and scripture calls us to take this in a worthy manner, repentant of the Lord. And so before we take of the bread and the cup, let us pray and prepare our hearts.
Our Lord, we hold these elements and recognize what they mean. Lord, these are significant, a marker of the greatest sacrifice ever made for the sake of humanity. And so, Lord, as we come to the table, we pray that you would prepare our hearts. Lord, would you bring to mind sin that has been festering and forgive. Lord, would you call our hearts to repentance and heal us. Lord, we know that there has been sin and we pray that you would wipe it clean. Make us right. Even as we take of the bread and the cup. It's in the name of our Lord and risen Savior, Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. So here, this story from Corinthians, how the Apostle Paul described it. For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you. And the Lord Jesus, in the night in which he was betrayed, he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it. And he said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Now in the same way, take the cup and peel back the There you go. So continuing in the scripture. In the same way, Jesus took the cup after supper and said, this cup is a new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink of it in remembrance of me. And as the passage finishes in 1 Corinthians, for as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Let's pray together. Father, we do. We proclaim your death. We preach Jesus Christ and him crucified. In fact, we shout it into the darkness that Jesus Christ went to the cross for our sake. And Lord, as we shouted into the darkness, we look up and we remember the resurrection, we remember the ascension, we remember Pentecost. Lord, we remember the Holy Spirit coming down upon the church. Lord, and we're grateful that we get to be a part of that. We're grateful that we get to be a part of this meal that you have passed down to us. We take it with you, we take it for you, and we remember what you did on our behalf. It's in the name of our Lord and risen Savior, Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. We continue in a spirit of gratitude, and if you will find in your worship bulletin this, now thank we all our God. Let's stand together and sing one verse.
We will have our time of response now. And this is your time to continue your faithful obedience unto the Lord. How is God calling you to respond this morning? Now, there are some ways listed at the bottom of your listening sheet on your bulletin. You may want to respond to God in one of those ways. Um, you might want to stay just where you are. Pray that the Lord would work on your heart. But also, this is a time that you, you can come forward. The, the altar is open. Uh, you can come kneel at the altar and pray here. Brian will be up at the front. I'll, I'll be on this side. Um, we'd be happy to pray with you. Or if you want to talk about accepting Christ or baptism or becoming a part of this church, um, you can do that at this time. And so the orchestra is, is going to play. They're, they're going to be on video um, playing. And as they play, we pray that you would respond to God as he's called you to this morning. So let's respond. <laughs>